So, well, hi. Have you guys, has everyone been to a Creative Mornings before? No? Raise your hand if you have been before. Have you ever seen anyone blow it, just like, <laughs> totally blow it? Because I, th I think that's what's going to happen right now. Um, you won't let us fly? Well, I don't think that you can help it. I think it's just going to happen. <laughs> so this, it's play. This month, the theme is play. So let's talk about play. <laughs> Mo Moby, Moby made an album in 1999 called Play. It didn't do very well at first. In its first week, it sold like 6,000 copies, which is, by today's standards, is a lot. But in 1999, before the music industry evaporated, um, it, did, it did very bad. And then 11 months later, as Moby did this like grueling tour with Bush for uh, like an MTV <laughs> sponsored thing, it, it, it just all of a sudden exploded and people loved it. And he had nine hit singles from this record and over 12 million albums of play, copies of play were sold worldwide. It did so, so well. <laughs> and then, yeah, this is a, a, an interesting thing about play. I don't know if you guys are familiar with music licensing, but that means when a song is used for a commercial or a TV show or a film, usually it's like one song, if you're lucky, gets licensed for work like that. but. Every, si does this have a laser pointer? It doesn't, okay. Every single song <laughs> was licensed from play, and that's never happened before on an album before. So um, that's, that's it. Thank you guys for being here. <laughs> he said 20 minutes. I thought I could talk more about each of these, but yeah, if you guys look under your, your chairs, there's a mini Herman Miller chair for everyone to take home. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh. No, I, we wouldn't do that to you. I'm s that's, that's horrible. I'm so sorry. I don't really talk like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> we just wanted to wake you up. Okay, uh, my name is Claire Evans. This is Jonna Bechtold. Um, together we make something called Yacht. I'm going to go over here because my notes are... <clears throat> Yacht is best known as a band, if it's known at all. Um, it's been a band for 10 years. It was started in 2002 by this, this schmuck over here as a solo project. Um, I joined in 2008. We were a two-piece for a while, but if you go see Yacht today, it's a four-piece rock and roll band. Um, we see being a band as an opportunity to create a lot of meaningful on- and off-screen experiences for a lot of different people in a lot of different mediums. And um, so this is a kind of a little collage of things that fall under the loose category of Yacht merch. That ranges from a neon sign that we sell as an addition to art object to a perfume that we designed in collaboration with a perfumer in Portland, Oregon to evoke a sensory mood related to our last record to uh, a book called The Secret Teachings of the Mystery Lights, which is kind of a philosophical tract that we made based on some of the ideas in one of our albums um, to a lot of more traditional rock and roll style merchandise like you know, limited edition vinyl LPs, or cassette tapes, or die cut sticker sheets, tote bags, t-shirts, pins, that kind of thing. We're really obsessive about design, and most everything that you see in the world, if you see anything at all, with our name on it, was either designed by us alone, or in really close collaboration with designers that we care about. These are some of the logos that we've used over the years. The anchors were designed by a friend of ours called Ian Lynham. The Shangri LA is one of ours. It was a logo type for our last record and for a lot of our merch. And this is the smiangle, the smiling triangle. 
<laughs> which was designed by Jana and has been our mascot for the last two or three years. As different as all these logos seem, they're actually connected by a bunch of needlessly arcane conceptual threads, which are illustrated in this diagram that we call the Yacht Map of Semiotics. As you can see, there are religious themes, there's the void, there's the notion of strength, happiness, and love, all combined into one uh, series of logos. We believe that design is powerful and that logos as the one piece of design that for a band is probably the most forward-facing thing, are really incredibly powerful. And so when we set about to create a logo, we think about that power and we think about where it will end up. Because music is emotional, and for a band, the logo is a lot bigger than just visual shorthand or branding. It's a kind of symbol for the greater ethos of what the band represents. If you think about all the classic punk rock logos, Crass, the Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, Nirvana, The Descendants, Bad Religion, People wear those icons on their bodies or on their clothes, not because they want to say like, I love Black Flag, but because they want to identify with a larger philosophical, emotional ethos that's related to punk rock. But, but they, also, they also love Black Flag sometimes. Well, you, yeah, yes, but it's bigger than that. <laughs> it's bigger than that. <laughs> it says something about you and it says something about your tribe and it allows you to find other people that can identify with the same ideas. In a sense, religious icons really work the same way. Uh, they're just as much personal as they are a beacon for finding your peers. And in a lot of times, they really kind of look the same. It's hard to tell them apart. Often, though, symbols and their meanings can become divorced. And an example of this, a hugely superficial example in the light of this punk rock and religious icons that we just threw up, is our logo typeface, which we designed in 2009 um, for our record, Sea Mystery Lights, which was an album deeply concerned with mystery and spirituality and kind of anchored by the idea of trinities and triangles. So we used a triangle in the A of our logo. Five years later, the triangle for A thing has become bona fide ubiquitous. And we're totally not taking credit for this. <laughs> but it goes to show like how sticky symbols are. And we've really enjoyed watching the triangle for A develop into a full-blown design meme, reaching its inevitable apex and collapse at the peak of corporate culture. <laughs> Earlier this year, actually, we witnessed that collapse firsthand as a t-shirt with our logo type and an adapted lyric from one of our songs started popping up in Macy's and Kohl's stores all around the country. On one level, we were outraged, but on the other hand, it's really fascinating. It's, we just watched a symbol lose all of its meaning just as it was being seen by millions of people. Somewhere along the way, it stopped being ours. And I don't know, maybe this is like woo-woo, but we believe that once an idea is put out into the world, it doesn't really belong to you anymore. Culture is this big, mushy thing that the human race uses as like an external hard drive. The science fiction writer William Gibson calls it a prosthetic memory. And this Coles thing, it's like, it is theft, but it also isn't theft. It's just sort of the zeitgeist. And on some level, we're thrilled to be part of it, because it means that we're part of the conversation. Anyway, there are way bigger things wrong with the world and we're more interested in creative forms of protest. The most recent of these um, is a song called Party at the NSA that we released last month, um, protesting the unwarranted surveillance of private citizens by the government. This issue is hugely important to us, which I don't know if you've gleaned this from the talk so far, but we're really big on the internet. It's the single most important force for creativity that we've ever encountered in our lives. And we see it as this like, extension of all the DIY spaces and punk spaces that we grew up in as kids. And so it makes us feel hugely uncomfortable to think of sinister forces tromping around on it. But what is a protest song anymore? I mean, this isn't the 60s. In the 21st century, there are different concerns. So in our mind, it's not just music. Do you want to talk about this? No, go ahead. <laughs> just butt in any time. Okay. Um, so we designed a, a whole sort of multimedia campaign. Uh, we made a microsite, John made a microsite, uh, partyattheNSA.com, and we started selling the MP3 online in exchange for donations to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a donation-supported nonprofit that litigates on behalf of the public interest against the government and corporations that collude with it to invade privacy. We partnered with a design blog called Nothing Major to create a T-shirt of the party and this, the NSA art, which was designed by an illustrator called Tim Lahan in New York. Um, and they're selling that online and donating all the profits to the EFF as well. This has now evolved from kind of a digital experiment into a very sincere, 
real world protest because now we're performing at the biggest, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the biggest organized rally against government surveillance called Stop Watching Us at the end of this month in Washington, D.C. We'll talk about this probably a lot more throughout the, this morning, but the fact that we have access to tools and technologies that allow us to create meaningful connections with people both on and offline and that can move seamlessly from an offline to an online environment is for us an opportunity that we feel we can never underestimate. The way we see it, it's one thing to make, hey, go back. Sorry. <laughs> it's one thing to make, go back. It builds automatically. Oh, wow, sorry. great. So sorry. It's one thing to make music design or whatever, I can just remember it. It's one thing to make text, music, websites that make people's online experiences more interesting, but it's a lot more interesting and meaningful to make things that make people's real world experiences more interesting and fun. So we're actually working on an app right now uh, that we hope will make people in LA's experiences of the city and of the people around them in the city more fun. It's called Five Every Day, and it's basically an extremely simple app that tells you five interesting things to do in Los Angeles every day. There's no future, there's no past, there's no calendar. You just open up the app and you get inspired to try a new restaurant or go to an exhibition or explore some strange, interesting part of the city, go to some weird ethnic market you've never been to. Make connections with people and places around you. Technology is a tool for connection, after all, and even though we use it to isolate ourselves a lot of the time. It's also a highly democratizing tool, and thanks to the internet, we've been able to try and do, and in a sense, trick people into believing that we are capable of things beyond our purview, countless times. In 2008, for example, we started a laptop accessories company called Manila Mac with absolutely no experience whatsoever. Manila Mac makes laptop accessories that look like manila envelopes and airmail envelopes for the MacBook Air and iPad. We had the idea while we were watching Steve Jobs' 2008 keynote, the one where he took the MacBook Air out of the manila envelope. We immediately thought, like, wouldn't it be great if there was a laptop case that looked like that? Wouldn't it be cute? Wouldn't people want that? We were living in a remote part of Texas at the time, but we managed to miraculously get our hands on some upholstery vinyl. We made a mock-up, we made a website, and literally within 48 hours, we'd sold 2,000 Manila Macs. It was totally, yeah, we, we set it up just mostly as a joke. The, the, the vinyl that we got from this Kmart-like store in the far west Texas desert, well, they, it was like a very pale green, and so we just made the, the thing as best as we could, took pictures of it, photoshopped it. This was all within 24 hours of the keynote that Steve Jobs did. And so, yeah, we, we thought at best we would sell a hundred of these sleeves, went to sleep, woke up, and PayPal was totally broken. They locked our account for selling too many, and it was a real wild experience to try to catch up with orders, having no idea how to even manufacture these things. Yeah, needless to say, this is a ridiculous way to start a company, and I do not recommend it. But we eventually figured it out in kind of a trial by fire. We like registered as an LLC. We figured out like what a UPC code is and how it works. Mo we figured out how to make them in two weeks and also ship them from the remote town that we were living in. We figured out material sourcing and manufacturing. It was exhausting. It was took over our lives for months, but it was fun. And Manila Mac still exists. And one thing that we learned from this, and it, I think is really important to us, is that anything can be figured out. Like, if you don't know how to do something, there's a PDF, there's a YouTube, there's a person, there's a book that can tell you how to do it. And the rest, you can just figure out with brute force or trial and error. Um, now we love taking on projects that are way beyond our skill set because we know that those projects are the ones that are going to teach us the most. The more unqualified you are to take something on, at least for us, the more you'll benefit from it. So now we're always super excited to tackle things that are way beyond us. Right now we're working on a collaboration with a Brazilian accessories company called Chili Beans. We're making a line of sunglasses, which is another thing that we... T <laughs> nice. Yeah, thanks. It's another thing we have no idea how to do. We've never really done that kind of like apparel manufacturing, but we're approaching with the same frame of mind, which is just bite off more than you can chew and figure it out later. This month's theme is play, as John has so eloquently told you earlier which is an interesting one for us because apart from all this design stuff, we're a band and the word play is a big part of our everyday vocabulary as in, hey, Jonna, 
a promoter wants us to drive down to San Diego and play a show. That's um, it's an idiosyncrasy of the music world that like offers for employment use that word exclusively, because of course when we play we're actually wor at work, and every day we live with this contradiction, which is I th maybe accidentally profound. Like, work is play, and play is work. For some people, it's probably hard to imagine that jumping around in front of hundreds or thousands of people could ever be qualified as play or playful. And it isn't, you know, it's like daunting and embarrassing and stressful a lot of the time, or just terrifying a lot of the time. But because that word play is so firmly entrenched in it, it reminds us of the same lessons that we've learned from a lot of our non-musical projects, which is that every scary thing that you do is just a warm up for the next even scarier thing. The scariest thing that we're doing right now by a mile is that we're developing a comedy pilot with Amazon Studios called Support. Support is a dark comedy about the life and times of an opening band, the sort of unglamorous reality of being within arm's reach of your goals while still being at the total bottom of the totem pole. And like we, we love to write, but we've never written anything like this before. We're totally unqualified, but we feel like Manila Mac, like with our band, like with a lot of things that we do, that the technical things can be learned, but it's the stories and experiences that you bring into it that really can't be taught. We both grew up, and this, this might explain why we're broken in this way. <laughs> we both grew up in the DIY culture in the Pacific Northwest, and um, like scarcity of resources have, have always been kind of a definitive aspect of our experience as artists growing up. Like, along with everyone that else that we knew, we always silkscreened our own t-shirts, and booked our own shows, booked our own tours, made our own CDs, shot our own music videos, made our own websites. The punk scene in the Northwest when we were growing up was always really defined by this really independent spirit, by this DIY or punk spirit. And the aesthetic that came with it was rough around the edges, defined by the inconsistency of the handmade. But we've always been really big technology geeks too. Uh, this is like a, this is actually a slideshow of our website over the last over 10 years and how it's changed. Um, and we realized early on that we have access to these incredible tools at the consumer level, just to schmucks like us, that we could use to totally transform ourselves and our image. We have access to the same software and the same hardware as paid professionals in design and marketing and production. We had access to the same resources. And when the audience locally as well as globally is always perceiving the end result on a two-dimensional flat plane in their hands or on their desks, then the playing field is totally flat because who's to say what engine is behind that screen, if it's a whole team of people, of professionals that have been educated and trained and paid to do this, or if it's just a couple of kids. We, after all, we've managed to convince people that we're a band, that we're a laptop company, that we're a cult, um, that we're a group of organized political dissenters, that we're public speakers. But we realized early in our career, and we're consistently reminded of it, is that you can totally use all of these tools to erase all of the rough, handmade edges that have always been prized as tokens of integrity in our like punk communities growing up. We could actually take the spirit, the underlying ethos of the things that we were taught as young kids and bring this pract its practice to a higher and maybe more beautiful level. YACHT is actually an acronym. It stands for Young Americans Challenging High Technology. It's sort of mysteriously based on this sign that Jonna once saw, if you want to talk about it. I just saw this sign in, in Portland, Oregon in 2001. It was a defunct, I think, like after hours adult schooling program, but I'm not, yeah, I have no idea what it actually is. No, There's no document of it online anywhere, but I, I was intrigued by it, and that's why our band is called Yacht, not because of fancy boats or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, don't be confused. Um, yeah, so challenging high technology. We've never meant that as a Luddite thing. People sometimes misunderstand that. We mean challenge in the sense of discourse, conversation, um, experimentation. For us, technology is a man-made tool and it's supposed to suit the needs of man and woman. And in order to reach that potential, it has to be pushed and pulled and subverted and played with, um, used for strange purposes perhaps, and fitted to the needs of the many as well as the needs of the few. So for that reason, we purposely use software and the web kind of wrong. Um, we make videos in keynote software, we make images in video software, we try to engage people in a consistent high level of discourse, even on the darkest and most hateful corners of the internet. We think of our laptops as like punk rock instruments, as ridiculous as that sounds. They're only as valuable as the feelings and the people using them. 
In other words, we kind of live by this axiom by Buckminster Fuller. All of humanity now has the option to make it successfully and sustainably by virtue of our having minds, discovering principles, and being able to employ these principles to do more with less. Doing as much as possible with as little as possible. That's the bare bones of punk rock. It's a philosophy that's born from need and maintained because it works and because constraints always provide for really interesting challenges. We believe that it never benefits an artist to tune out the details. Because we've tackled so much early on, we know how to run a band like a business. Like we know how to deal with every pragmatic concern of being a band from organizing tours to doing the accounting. We know how to build a team that we can trust. And because we always make unusual things with very little resources, we can now tell you about like the top and middle and bottom notes of perfumes, how neon signs are made, app development, how UPCs work, paper stock, letter pressing, tape dubbing, manufacturing abroad, dealing with the fallout from manufacturing abroad. <laughs> In our world, all work is play because all work really channels through this spirit that we will probably always have, which is, ha ha, nobody knows that behind all of this stuff is just two kids from the Pacific Northwest on their laptops. Tricking the world is the ultimate game. Thanks.